You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, friends. Welcome back to The Corbett Report. I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, coming to you from the sunny climes of Western Japan here on the 23rd day of April, 2021. Welcome to episode 400 of The Corbett Report podcast, Visions of the Future. Now, It is a point that I've been making quite a bit recently on the podcast, and deservedly so, I think, that what we face is less a super-secret agenda that cannot be understood in any way except from anonymous inside whistleblower sources or something along those lines, and more an open conspiracy that is openly talked about, openly written about, openly discussed, and all we have to do is take it literally and seriously when the would-be controllers of the world, the elitists, get together and talk about their plans. Why don't we actually listen to them? No crystal ball required, no super secret inside sources, no trust me on this, guys, I know the secret details. No, no, let's listen to what they are openly saying about where the world is heading and see what we can see from this. Now, this is an activity that I've engaged in Uh, before on the podcast, so I'll throw in some links to some of the previous ways that uh, I've I've done this, how how to predict the future and things along those lines. But let's roll up our sleeves today and take a journey through the future. What is coming in the next decades based not on what I'm speculating or guessing or reading the tea leaves, but what these would-be social engineers and controllers of society are openly saying about where the world is heading. Now, I am going to attempt, to the best of my ability, to refrain from editorializing on any of this content. I just want to, in to the extent that it's possible, just present these various scenarios and predictions and ideas without comment, because I think they do speak for themselves and paint their own picture. But I will just be the guide guiding you through this vision of the future, this, this journey through the timeline towards the imagined future of the elitists. So let's start this journey into the future by uh, getting off on the first stop, the first station along this uh, way path. 2025, four years from now, what does the world look like? What is happening? Now, there are a couple of different places we can go for specifically visions of 2025. And the first one we're going to uh, land on is a report That was issued by the John Hopkins Center for Health Security, uh, which I hope you will recognize by now as being, oh, one of these things that bodies that keeps uh, popping up in these scenarios that tend to come to reality, including, of course, Event 201, which we all know about by now, right? The uh, October 2019 simulation of a globally spreading coronavirus. Well, we're going to look at a different scenario that they had planned back in 2017 called the SPARS pandemic 2025 to 2028, which I note quizzically has for some reason reappeared on people's radar over the past few weeks, and I've received a lot of emails about it, but the independent media was talking about this months and months and months ago. For example, uh, The Last American Vagabond posted an article uh, authored by frequent corporate report guest Derek Brose back in November of last year, The Spars Pandemic of 2025, Echo Chambers and Vaccine Opposition, going through this document. So I will throw in the link both to the document itself and to Derek Brose's article so you can read read the, uh, read the actual scenario and what they talked about and then read Derek Brose's analysis of it. But long story short, this is a vision of a possible coronavirus pandemic that could sweep across the globe starting in 2025 and starting in St. Paul, thus SP, and then ARS, uh, Acute Respiratory Syndrome. So SPARS was the imaginary name for this imaginary disease or uh, virus that they imagined might spread across the globe in the year 2025 and uh, ultimately engulf the world in a three-year-long pandemic. And this report is written from the perspective of 2030 after the pandemic is officially over, but uh, looking back at the lessons learned. Now, to some extent, this is less of a prediction of specifics about the future than sort of talking about general a lot of things that are actually quite relevant to what we're living through today. This is less about 2025 per se than it is about 
how will the world react to the next pandemic, which we know is coming somehow in 2017. Well, but there are a, a couple of moments in this report that are quite illuminating as to where we could be ending up in the next few years, given the technological trends and what that implies for the way that we communicate with each other, which is a point that Derek Bros does pick up in this article and that he does highlight uh, in an interview that he did with Ryan uh, Christian of The Last American Vagabond at the time that this report was published in November of last year. So to start off for people to understand this, I, it stands basically, it's the interesting part for me, one of the most interesting parts was that this was actually gamed out in October of 2017. So it's another example of them predicting coronavirus being this focal point. And this is, and they're predicting this as if it takes place in 2025. And as you write in the article, it's, it's basically written from the perspective of somebody looking back over the pandemic in 2030 and writing about it all. So it's like they already knew what happened. And that's what the article is talking about, or even the study, is that they know that they were wrong. They know that all these things went bad. And they're, it's basically about controlling the people. That's what this always comes down to. Um, the, the fictional place, I believe, or actually not fictional, but the place that's hypothetical in the study was St. Paul. And they actually, that's what the name comes from, St. Paul, Minnesota, St. Paul Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus or SPARS-CoV, just so people understand what those names are coming from. Now, I find it so incredible that 2017, they can write, they can, they can outline how this thing will play out in the same ways that we're seeing now. And to start off with the one point that I think is interesting is the idea of the social media aspect. So let's touch on that and how it relates to now, because what, they, what they, you pointed out in the article is they describe the world that they seem to be building, right? That we're echo chambers and we're dividing and we're intentionally going for sources that we think agree with what we're saying. And that that's the problem that leads to actions they take. Right, I find that to be fascinating that they know at this time that it's something that they're building, and yet they point to it as the pro. It's almost a problem, reaction, solution in, in real time kind of idea. You know, what what are your thoughts on the social media aspect? Well, I think just to what your point your point there you're saying about the problem, reaction, solution. I do think that's. I mean, that's why they do these simulations and these war games. It's not just because. They're, these are kind, caring people that are just trying to make sure they're prepared for anything. I mean, I know that's the sort of mainstream response is like, well, of course, we wouldn't we want these institutions to be testing this out and to try to be as prepared as possible. But we clearly we know that, that there's more to that. And yeah, it, it just seems like a script in so many ways. The social media part, I thought was really interesting because uh, well, for one, like, the trends seem to be coming to real life. I, again, I think that's by design. Um, and they describe a few different types of technology. So again, the two trends that they say are likely to influence public health emergencies are varying degrees of access to information technology and fragmentation among populations, uh, including along social, political, religious, ideological, and cultural uh, lines. And so this fragmented echo chamber world has all the different technology you can think of, including something that they, they talk about, like universal near access to Wi-Fi, basically. But they also discuss a new technology, which I, th I thought was really interesting because if this pops up in the next couple of years, Ryan, I think that's like another, right. well, here they are. This is what they're anticipating. And they call it um, internet accessing technology, just IAT, which they describe as thin, flexible screens that can be temporarily attached to briefcases, backpacks, or clothing, and used to stream content from the internet. And which, so, by the way, we've seen on a thousand movies in like yeah, the last decade, right? So like exactly. this those flimsy little things that are everywhere. That's like, we all know what that's talking about. And they're working on them for sure. They thought with these next generation of phones, they were going to be able to do it, these foldable phones, but the technology is not quite there yet. But that's what they're working on, which obviously, like, I mean, just in, as far as activism goes, it opens up a whole range of things. And they even discuss that in this, how activists start using that technology. We'll get into that in a moment. Uh, they also discuss how the social media platforms, they focus on, of course, Facebook, Twitter, the real life platforms, TikTok, but they also mention this other one that they said, you know, it's, I guess it's created for the simulation. But once again, if somebody pops up with a platform like this, I'm going to be like, hey, look, this is what they were anticipating. And it's called ZapQ. And they describe it as a platform that enables users to aggregate and archive selected media content from other platforms and communicate with cloud-based social groups based on common interest in current events. I mean, in the way they describe it, it seems like it's sort of like an all-in-one platform that can connect all your other social media together and you can share across them seamlessly. And basically those two things, the IAT flexible screens, along with these new types of social media, they say make it for easier for people to share information more than ever, even more than we have at the current moment. 
but also it causes many people to, quote, self-restrict their sources that they turn to for information, which creates those echo chambers that they're describing. Yeah, that, that I feel is the, obviously the, the point, right? So it's not mm-hmm. that, you know, the, the, it's almost, that what I find fascinating about that is they're taking an idea that on its face should be something where like, yes, that's fantastic. A site that allows you to have control and allows you to this, but they make it out to be something that's a negative, right? Yeah. You have too many choices and you're thinking for yourself and it, al- mm-hmm. and it ends up driving you into these echo chambers. So we need to, you know, that's what that, it's like the, the, the teacher going, no, 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 like that's not yeah. how you should be doing this. And that's what it definitely felt like. They're painting it like that. And I, I think that broadens out to so many more things than this study or Mm COVID-19. Historically speaking, they always try to do that and frame these things like a WikiLeaks scenario as something that we should not be supporting. It's it's interesting. All right. I really hope that you will listen to that conversation in its entirety. I think it is interesting and still relevant, even six months after that conversation was recorded, or at the very least, read Derek Brose's analysis of the Spars pandemic document if you haven't read the document yet itself, um, because it is actually interesting on a number of different levels. But I will I will refrain from further editorial comment other than to say that there are a lot of nuggets in there that are highly relevant to what we're living through today with regards to how the public responds to this imaginary sparse pandemic and how the authorities then respond to that response and what ultimately ends up happening as a result of that. But as I say, that's less of a prediction of what the world will look like in 2025 than sort of a preparation for what we're living through right now. So let's move on to the next stop again in 2025, a different vision of that future. And this vision coming from Cognizant, specifically their Center for the Future of Work, which released a report uh, last year called After the Virus, the uh, World of 2025, which you will, I'm sure, be familiar with because you saw my Propaganda Watch episode where I went through this document in detail and went through all the pages with you and talked about the document, where it came from, what it means, and the Bilderberg, literal Bilderberg attendees who help, who wrote it. Um, but let's just take a look from, again, part of their video that they made in this imaginary, we're in the year 2025 looking back at the last few years, and let's see what they come up with as to how the next few years will unfold. Well, hi everybody. I think everybody's on now, so uh, let's get started. Um, Well, it's May the 25th, 2025. I can't believe how time has flown, Um, and I thought it would be a good time today to talk about, you know, what we've been seeing in the last few years since the coronavirus pandemic, since the crisis. It's almost five years now, and... um, Clearly, so much has changed. Very little is unchanged um, by what by what's happened. Um, the way we educate children, the way we heal ourselves medically, uh, the way we bank, the way we do everything, the way we entertain ourselves. And clearly, perhaps for, first and foremost amongst the things that have changed is the way we work. Uh, clearly, kind of virtually and online has become the norm. Travel's the last resort, not the first resort now. I mean, are we surprised that that change has really stuck and uh, and we're just so routinely and um, normally working like this now? Well, I'm not surprised, Ben. No. When the doors opened after the COVID-19 crisis and we could go back to the office, many employees asked, why would we when we can so effectively work from home? No, and it turned out that they never went back, right? So the, along came the COVID-19 Big Bang and it sort of vaporized all of these old work from home canards about teleshirking or the fact that, you know, there are certain work supposedly that could never be done virtually. And so as I remember, the pandemic came along and necessity kind of dictated, get over it, get going and get used to it. And so initially, you know, after some weeks of fumbling around with Zoom rooms and these sort of goofy online cocktail parties, work streams absolutely emerged that were cheaper and faster and of higher quality. We are seeing this big shift towards every home being retrofitted with dedicated home office spaces equipped with soundproofing, separate voice driven entrances, podcast booths, 3D printers and ergonomic everything. And people aren't just using these spaces for remote work. They double up as the new social hangouts. 
you see any ideas or key themes emerging here? Because uh, I think you're correct if you do, but wait, there's more. Let's move ahead in this timeline to the next predicted year, 2030. And when we alight at this particular station on our journey, what will we find? Of course, what comes to mind when you think of the year 2030? Well, if you've been successfully predictively programmed, then you will think of, say it with me, Agenda 2030. Or, more precisely, if you want to play along at home, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And of course, I will include the link to un.org so you can read along at home about Agenda 2030 and what it's aiming to do. But in a nutshell, just reading from that page, we resolve between now and 2030 to end poverty and hunger everywhere, to combat inequalities within and among countries, to build peaceful, just, and inclusive societies, to protect human rights and promote gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls, and to ensure the lasting protection of the planet and its natural resources. We resolve also to create conditions for sustainable, inclusive, and sustained economic growth, shared prosperity, and decent work for all, taking into account different levels of national development and capacities. We further resolve that by 2030, all socially inclusive transportation will be powered by unicorn farts, sustainably. We will eliminate death by keeping everyone in a sustainable, environmentally friendly cryo-goo. And we will only allow sustainable gun drops to fall from the social justice providing non-denominational heavens. Sustainably. Did I mention sustainable? Anyway, yeah, if all of that sounds like utter hot air, mealy mouth blather that means nothing but sounds good, who can be against it? Let's end hog hunger and poverty and let's make a better world. Oh, okay. How do we go about doing that? Well, if you want some more details on that, of course, you can turn to the 17 sustainable development goals that were being pimped and pumped back in 2015 uh, when this was all launched at the UN and you'll of course, remember John Podesta's favorite goal, of course, number 14, talking about fish, because it's talking about the protecting the seas, right? That's, that's what that's all about. But anyway, if you want a little bit further analysis on these development goals and what they really mean and what 2030 has in store for us, you can turn, for example, back to the coverage that James Evan Pilato and I did back at the time on New World Next Week. The United Nations launches their 2030 Agenda Blueprint for a United World. And we'll take this from Activist Post. Have you heard of the Global Goals? And if you hadn't, you're going to hear of them by now because they've laid it out. The United Nations launched a set of 17 ambitious goals that it plans to achieve over the next 15 years. The formal name of this new plan is the 2030 Agenda. But those behind it decided that they needed something catchier to promote these ideas to the general population. The UN has stated that these new global goals represent a new universal agenda for humanity. Virtually every nation on the planet has willingly signed on to this new agenda, and you're going to participate whether you like it or not. Some of the biggest stars in the entire world have been recruited to promote the global goals. There's a great cult video with lots of celebs you can wash your brain with, but there was also the Global Citizen Festival held in Central Park in New York this last Saturday, where some of the biggest names in the music industry promoted these new global goals. The feel-good event was timed to coincide, of course, with the annual gathering of world leaders at the United Nations General Assembly, hashtag UNGA, featuring performances by the We'll Say Yes to Anything band with Beyonce and Pearl Jam and Coldplay and the usual suspects. And it wasn't just the entertainment industry that was promoting this new UN plan. For United World, that's right, Pope Francis traveled to New York to give the address that kicked off the conference where this new agenda was unveiled. So 17 is a lot of things, and we can't go over all of them here, but Truthstream Media kind of did a good bullet point, and they sort of did the easy translation of what they really mean with these 17 different goals. So James, again, everything is linked. We implore people to go read all of these for themselves. I'm just going to pick my favorite of the 17 and mention it here. Goal number seven, ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. And again, as Truthstream kind of notes, that means smart grid. That means smart meters. That means your fridge, the Internet of Things. It's going to monitor and track everything that you do. And it may seem neat because, oh, I, I've got a good workout routine or the fridge told me I'm out of milk. But it's going to be so much more, James. 
Yes, and let me pick uh, a couple of my favorites from this <laughs> list. Uh, there, I mean, it's such mealy-mouthed, wishy-washy nothingness that, it, of course, you have to agree with the ideas of these goals. End poverty in all its forms everywhere. Who is against that idea? But the question is, how do you do that? And I think the translation from True Stream Media is pretty apt. Centralized banks, IMF, World Bank, Fed to control all finances, digital one-world currency, and a cashless society. Hey, end poverty. Wow. And now we'll control absolutely every aspect of the global financial architecture and monetary system. Or goal number two, I think, was also pretty to the point. End hunger. Achieve food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. Sustainable agriculture. Translation, GMO. Of course. Of course they're going to roll it out. Of course. We need these genetically modified monstrosities. They're so perfectly safe. And uh, oh, by the way, yeah, <clears throat> the same interests that fueled the, the big uh, industrial agricultural revolution of the 19th 1960s are the same Rockefeller financial and uh, interests that are funding the gene revolution of the biotech companies. But don't worry about that. Don't worry about all of that mess. It's it's all good. It's being promoted by the UN. What could possibly go wrong? Same crap, different name. Uh, I'm glad that a lot of people are already on board with this and already understand it. But please do help to spread this understanding before the global goals become the next must uh, must uh, like a fashion accessory for the you know the 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 millennial crowd of uh, support for, you know, Facebook memes and things like that. Uh, that's what they're going to try. That's the way they're going to try to push this crap. And we have to come out against it as of right from the beginning. Of course, Agenda 2030, a.k.a. 20, Agenda 21, a.k.a. the Sustainable Development Goals, all part of that UN package, which I will simply note parenthetically and give my younger self my more black-bearded self, a uh, big pat on the back there for pre successfully, unfortunately, predicting that the Sustainable Development Goals would become a fashion accessory. I think I meant it more metaphorically when I was speaking there, but it has literally become a fashion accessory. And I don't know about you, but I have started to notice in my actual real daily life here some of the Japanese salarymen and businessmen carry, uh, wearing that little rainbow-colored pin, circular pin, representing the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, it is literally a fashion accessory that I see with increasing frequency, at least here in Japan. And uh, every time I see it, unconsciously, without even thinking about it, I just know, oh, this is a brainwashed zombie. <laughs> so it is a good way of identifying people who have swallowed the Kool-Aid Kool all the way. But uh, unfortunately, yes, it has literally become a fashion accessory. Anyway, refraining from editorializing further, we'll move along to our next our next interesting um, marker, milestone, again in the year 2030, this one coming from Time Magazine, which, in case you haven't seen, has recently published Destination 2030, 10 Years to Change the World. And uh, <laughs> I realize this is the second episode in a row that I have referenced an actual physical copy of Time Magazine. Um, but I assure you, I am not a subscriber to Time, and <laughs> this is not because I'm pimping Time Magazine in particular, when I was in the library getting that 2006 edition of Person of the Year, you, for YouTube, uh, that I referenced uh, in episode 399, I, all, I happened to see this Destination 2030, and uh, I thought I should probably pick that up and see what they have to say. Scry the tea leaves. And, uh, well... I suppose I was not disappointed insofar as there are some interesting nuggets in here, um, but obviously nothing that uh, I think we want to be hearing. Anyway, uh, this one starts uh, with an editorial from uh, the, the uh, new editor-in-chief, Edward Felsenthal, and also I will simply note that uh, in episode 399, I was off the top of my head. I was just referencing that editorial from the then editor-in-chief, Richard Stengel, was it, uh, in the Person of the Year 2006 editorial and saying, I don't know, uh, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb and predict that this Richard Stengel is all on board with the censorship that's happening online now, despite the fact he was saying it's, it's such a great freeing thing and it'll be wonderful and people will say it'll turn into anarchy, but I, I believe in the people. And I just said that off the top of my head. And yes, as some people dug up in the comment section, yeah, actually, if you look it up, he's not, he is now literally writing books about the Russian disinformation threat and how people need to be censored off the internet. Surprise, surprise. So this particular 
Time editor uh, editor is um, talking about 2030. And of course, he starts out by talking about the various times over the last couple of decades that Time magazine has featured the bird flu or the SARS or the H1N1 threat on its cover and warning about the next pandemic and we're not ready. So clearly, Time has some credentials as crystal ball readers. But um, now they're working on a project called Time 2030, which will focus on how we build a healthier, more resilient, more just world. And we'll talk to some of the world's most innovative thinkers about what comes next. So this is apparently an ambitious decade-long project. Apparently for the next 10 years, you can read in the pages of time, I'm sure at regular intervals, about uh, what's what's coming over the course of this decade, which seems to be a decisive one for the globalist uh, plans. They say, why 2030? This is the year by which the UN Sustainable Development Goals, targets on equality, poverty, health, growth, and sustainability, uh, sustainability will be met or missed. Adopted in a rare moment of global consensus by every member state of the UN, and therefore it must be great. These SDGs have become key benchmarks for commitments by policymakers and business leaders alike. By 2030, we will know whether we're on the path toward a better planet. Hmm, better. I think we might need to define that. And probably not leave it up to people like Edward Felsenthal to decide what constitutes better. But anyway, so if you go through... Uh, into the, well, through the uh, pictorial section, they have an entire beautifully laid out pictorial about the inauguration of President Harris, I mean Biden, and uh, several pages of just loving pictures of Biden in office. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I have to go back and check. I'm pretty sure they didn't do that when Trump was inaugurated. But anyway, um, if you go through that to the Time 2030 section, you will see such things as Right there on the second, third page of this uh, uh, this particular series, Angelina Jolie, yes, CFR member Angelina Jolie, talking about tackling the climate crisis before we run out of time. And you get uh, Dr. Larry Brilliant on finding a way to rekindle the sense of global unity, talking about how we've lost the globalism has lost its mojo and become a dirty word, but we need to rekindle that wonder and. You get all sorts of mealy mouth nonsense. Invest in green stoves that will help feed the world. Use the internet to level the education playing field. Make every vehicle electric by 2030, that kind of stuff. There's a little section on Donut City. Amsterdam tries to live by a radical new economic theory and talking about how to lay out cities in a new donut style for sustainability, blah, blah, blah. There's uh, the vegan dynasty, how China could change the world by taking meat off the menu. And it's all about how the great, wonderful chai comms are going to lead the way into the new fake meat world. And they're going to be the ones to spearhead the new technology for making, I can't believe it's not meat, protein, plant-based protein substitutes that are going to become the norm because we can't, eating, eating cattle? Oh my God, that's, that's such a luxury. Not for you peasants. It'll only be on the plate at Davos, I'm sure. Um, and then actually there is, of course, Bill Gates, of course, is in here on the inaugural edition of Time's Destination 2030, their new decade-long project talking about where the world is going. Of course, they consult with Bill Gates, and he writes a completely vapid, meaningless, boring, totally useless little editorial on a green premium. Basically, how much how much are you uh, is the is the country and the world going to have to go uh, pay to go to zero carbon, zero net carbon over the next 10 years, 20 years, whatever? The green premium, as it were. It's completely useless. Um, I'm sure it's online if you really want to read it, but I think it's a waste of your time. Um, but uh, there is an interesting uh, a section in here on building a better internet, which I think contains some juicy nuggets about where the world is heading. It starts by saying the Trump era ended in 2021 with a violent mob storming the seat of American democracy. Among the many factors behind the riot, from white supremacy to President Trump's inflammatory rhetoric... Experts largely agreed that the flourishing of misinformation online played a major part. But when we look back on the 2020s, will that dark day in January be seen as a crescendo or as an omen? Da, da, da. So, of course, they frame it all as uh, in the way that you would expect. Yes, of course, Time Magazine. The very same Time Magazine that called you the person of the year back in 2006. Because finally, you get to participate directly and we can make this a wonderful democratic place. Are now saying, oh no, people are putting their own voices online. Ah! <laughs> surprise, surprise. So, of course, what are they ultimately saying should happen? Um, they're talking about one measure touted by President Biden has been the repeal of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Yay, isn't that what 
Isn't that what the Trump uh, supporters have been talking about the last few years? Repeal 230, repeal 230. Don't worry, Biden's going to repeal 230 for you guys. The federal law that pr protects social media companies from being sued for hosting illegal content, a provision that allows them to scale quickly and without risk. The platforms oppose the outright repeal of Section 230, arguing that it would force them to censor more content. Experts say Biden... Well, please don't throw us in that briar patch, Mr. Biden. Experts say Biden will need to not just repeal the law, but to replace it with a progressive, future or oriented version that gives social platforms the protections they need to exist, but also offers built-in mechanisms to hold them to account for their worst excesses. And again, I will refrain from editorializing other than to point you to Problem Reaction Solution Internet Censorship Edition, which lays out exactly what is happening now and exactly why it is happening. But anyway, um, yeah, they're telling you exactly what's going to happen here. And then they have a, a little uh, Q&A with uh, Shoshana Zubov, who's become... Uh, well known for the age of surveillance capitalism, talking about, again, how we need to censor and control and rein in big tech by making their algorithms democratically available and blah, blah, blah. Other, in other words, yeah, I mean, of course, as long as there's a Democrat in power, let's make sure that he has control over these big tech and can tell them to censor whoever off of the internet, right? Yeah. That's going to work out very well. Anyway, so that's the that's, that seems to be an, an, a core, integral part of Destination 2030, a new decade-long project that Time Magazine is launching to help steer the world to a better place, according to the publishers of Time Magazine. Let's move on to another 2030 milestone. Um, this one from our friends at the World Economic Forum. Yes, of course. Who can forget their eight predictions for the world in 2030? Um, most importantly, because it did, that did become infamous for a video which it contains some text about welcome to 2030, I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. And I think everyone has at least seen that video. I don't understand why that video took off. It's literally just some text on the screen. But more importantly, it, that was the actual name of an article that they uh, was put out by Ida Alken, who's this uh, da Danish, Danish pol parliamentarian uh, back several years ago at uh, Davos. Um, under the title, Welcome to 2030, I Own Nothing, Have No Privacy, and Life Has Never Been Better, which, for some reason or other, has been renamed Here's How Life Could Change in My City by the year 2030, and has a big asterisk and a note at the beginning now saying, some people have misinterpreted this by saying that I want... Blah, blah. Anyway, I have talked about that before, but uh, let's listen to a bit of Ida Elkin and her vision for what the world could look like in the next decade or two. Think about a car. Do you know how much a car drives? How much of its life? 4%. 4% is how much a car drives. Or if you take a drill, it's used 15 minutes. It's not a lot, is it? And most of us, we, I know there are some guys here that really love to own a drill. Um, but for the rest of us, we just want a hole in a wall, right? And, and I think we're going to a place where we just want mobility, where we don't care so much about owning a car. It's actually a little bit of trouble. If, we, if you just come to drive this car and pick me up and, and I can drive around and this car will be driving all the time. So I think we are moving to this. And also because of information technology, it's now possible to share things in a much more intelligent way where we don't feel all the time that this, we, this is something that we cannot trust or something that there is a little bit dirty or something that, I mean, car share for a long time was a problem because people left stuff in the cars and was a little bit disgusting. But now, you know, you rate people, so you don't leave stuff in the car, you just behave better. So the information technology has made it much more easy to share things and, and uh, much more easy to distribute. And I think the second we get driverless cars, and we know they are there, and they're on the street, why shouldn't a car, why should it be standing still 96% of the time? It will start driving. And when the car is, has such a high value, because it's driving all the time, of course you design it in a way that everything can be taken out. I know Apple are uh, looking at their, their phones now to see if they can get out all the rare earth materials, the gold, the silver, everything. Because if you take a pile of electronic waste, it has more gold in it than a gold mine does. So we're just losing it at the moment. So the second we start to use things much more intensely, and we will do that with the sharing economy, I think this will also push the idea that we will have no more waste. The economy of the future, ladies and gentlemen, as touted by the World Economic Forum and its associates. Anyway, moving right along, let's move along to the next year, 
2030, of course, a major milestone, and as Time Magazine tells us, we'll know if we're on the path to a better world or not by then. So what will happen after that point, you inquire? Well, never fret, there are plenty of uh, predictions about what's to come after that. One waypoint along the way would be the year 2035, which you will remember, potentially, in my recent Flash Mobs for Freedom edition of Solutions Watch, I talked about the DCDC Global Strategic Trends Program 2007 to 2036, which, despite its title, puts a lot of its predictions in the time frame of by the year 2035, dot, dot, dot. And it talks about a number of different things that are going to happen. And it was perhaps summarized in very broad detail by that Guardian article that I pointed to in that edition of Flash Mobs for Freedom, uh, that, that edition of Solutions Watch, call, uh, in an article entitled Revolution, Flash Mobs, and Brain Chips, A Grim Vision of the Future. But we can get some sort of deeper detail about what that actually means in the report itself. Uh, for example, we have... Uh, un there are. I, I invite you to go through the entire document because there are lots of different predictions on a lot of different specific things, talking about demographics and how that feeds into economic and geopolitical change, etc. But I thought it was perhaps most interesting to see how they tie this into the question of technology, of course, which is going to be developing at breakneck speeds over the course of the next couple of decades, few decades from the point at which this was written back in 2007. Uh, it says, technology is likely to produce breakthrough events at an unprecedented rate in the period out to 2035. And whilst government and military funded research will continue to produce significant novel niche applications, especially in Rus Russia, China, and the US, the overall pace and direction of technological development is likely to be driven by globalized demand and commercial logic. And it says the information revolution and increasing number of graduate level engineers and science professionals in the developing world will further stimulate this process. So it goes on to make a number of different specific predictions about what's likely to transpire in different fields. For example, nanotechnology, talking about advanced nanotechnology at the interdisciplinary frontier where physics, chemistry, and biology meet will be a key enabler of technological advance and will underpin many breakthroughs. And they go on to say that its application is likely to be predominantly in electronics and materials, including bacteria-resistant agents, stain-resistant materials, and nanocomposite materials. But after 2020, nano devices are likely, such as nanobots. Hmm, looking forward to that. And then it goes on to talk about ICT, information communication technology. By the end of the period, it is likely that the majority of the global population will find it difficult to turn the outside world off. ICT is likely to be so per to pervasive that people are permanently connected to a network or two-way data stream with inherent challenges to civil liberties. Being disconnected could be considered suspicious. There are a number of trends that will lead to this pervasiveness, including an expanding global economy, potentially far-reaching improvements in po processing power, greater cultural assimilation and awareness of technology, and the continued convergence of information and communication technologies. In turn, ICT will itself be a major engine of growth for the global economy. And then it goes on to biotechnology. De development in biotechnology biotechno is likely to be swift, as indicated by a significant increase in global biotech revenues and the purchase by large pharmaceutical companies of biotech firms in order to secure the most likely avenue for future of drug blockbuster development. And then it goes on to talk about genetic engineering and microbiology and genetic modification and R&D in those areas, which are going to be increasingly important. Uh, this this 2007 report for, uh, from the UK government, quite prescient, isn't it? Um, new energy technology, talking about different um, sources of power generation. Cognitive science, talking about essentially um, being able to map cognitive processes more and more uh, clearly and through the use of nanotechnology and biotechnology, not just mapping human brain functions, but the replication of genuine intelligence is possible before 2035. Um, sensor and network technology, etc. Talking, and then it talks about the risks of all of this. Um, the breadth and depth of the application of innovation will generate an unprecedented reliance on technology. Uh, responding to the increased speed and volume of information will challenge effective decision making pr uh, progressively at all levels. Uh, there's a number of knock-on effects of these technological changes, but clearly they are predicting, or were predicting, a 
almost you know a decade and a half ago at this point uh some pretty profound changes that were going to come as a result specifically of the technological developments that were going to take place over this very period that we're living through right now and well as i say i think some of those are definitely coming to pass especially around ict and biotechnology um but if we want to further that along just a few years we can now skip forward to the year 2040 yes we have arrived at 2040 where we can take, well, the, a different report that has uh, much of the same rhetoric and idea behind it. Uh, this is a global trends forecast, specifically Global Trends 2040, A More Contested World, which is a publication of the National Intelligence Council that was published in March of this year. And once again, I would suggest you read through it for a, a very similar type of report to that um, 2007 report we were just looking at for the global trends for the 2036 period. Well, by 2040, I think, again, a lot of the types of things they're talking about were going to simply be extended, and we can get some more information about this report and its significance. I'll take this from a an article that I was reading about Paul Kingsnorth and the CIA, um, where it, uh, the, the author writes, well, uh, The National Intelligence Council has released Global Trends 2040, the latest in a series of special documents published every four years by the NIC's Strategic Future Group to assess the key trends and uncertainties that will shape the strategic environment for the United States during the next two decades. It is a remarkable document. No one seems to have paid much attention to it yet, but I think that should change. While the analysts who wrote it are unable to describe what is happening inside the United States itself... In practice, these reports are mostly produced by the CIA, given that outward-facing strategic intelligence is their specialty and the agency is essentially forbidden from engaging in domestic matters. And (laughs) that's always applied in the past, right? They never breach that line. Their prediction of where the world is headed as a whole is both shockingly dire and fascinating in its candid acknowledgement of the havoc that a combination of a technological revolution and the ideological revolution of identity politics is unleashing on us all. Describing a storm of structural forces now driving global change, the report quickly specifies that many people are emphasizing and organizing around different aspects of their identities, including race, gender, and sexual orientation, noting that identity-based beliefs tend to eclipse truth-seeking, including because of the need to feel morally justified, It predicts that the combination of newly prominent and diverse identity allegiances and a more siloed information environment is exposing and aggravating fault lines within states, undermining civic nationalism and increasing volatility. And the report goes, this article goes on to say that this, all all of these trends are exacerbated by the fact that technological developments are likely to increase ever faster, transforming a range of human experiences and capabilities, while also creating new tensions and disruptions within and between societies. In particular, increased connectivity will help produce new efficiencies, conveniences, and advances in living standards. However, it will also create and exacerbate tensions at all levels, from societies divided over core values and goals to regimes that employ digital repression, to control populations. So I'll let you continue reading that article and then reading the report itself. But I think you will find that that's one of the overriding themes of this report, technological advancements and how they're going to impact with the fracturing of society on the structural and societal level. So this is one of the effects of the technological advances that are being predicted for the coming decades at this point as we start looking forward to 2040. And as we are at 2040, we should look at another interesting vision of the future that that was advanced several years ago. And longtime listeners of The Corporate Report will have heard this a few times now, but why not throw it in again? This is uh, a a concept called Plandopolis, which was one of four visions for megacities on the move, which was a presentation of sorts that were put together by the Forum for the Future, which is an interesting organization that I suggest you look into, um, including its friends and partners list. It has some names that I think will raise a few eyebrows in there. What is this Forum for the Future and what are they they doing? Oh, they're talking about how, for example, technology and societal changes are going to impact the way we live our lives. And they, in that regard, they had a report on megacities on the move. What will the megacities of the future look like? And one of their visions was for a nightmare dystopian hellhole called Plandopolis that I'm not quite sure they actually intended to be a dystopia. But at any rate, it certainly comes across that way.
Hi. I'm so glad you're on time. I'm V. I'm looking forward to showing you around Planopolis today. My husband works from home. He's a virtual engineer working on one of the city's desalination plants. He controls the robots who do all the important maintenance. I think he basically plays computer games for a living. <laughs> Are you ready to go? Have you got your calorie card open on your smartphone? I registered your visit with Slick Travel Corp the other day, so they've uh, allotted you a journey time to, to match mine. It makes so much sense, doesn't it? Switch off brain and go to work. <laughs> with this many people around, I'm glad there's a mega computer in charge. We're so lucky. Uh, our kids were allocated a school quite near my practice so I can drop them off on the way. It saves on our calorie ration. Well, it won't be long until the little darlings get their career announcements. They've been working so hard, so I'm sure they'll get something good. N not that there's anything wrong with fixing carbon scrubbers for a living or anything. Are you hungry? Let's pop to the market as we're passing. Right, what's on the menu this month? No, not meat. It's not your birthday. The Global Food Council are doing a really good job of keeping food production going. I mean, you don't get the choice you used to, but we're better off than most. I think it's probably easiest to walk from here. You barely see a car in the city centre nowadays, unless you're rich. <laughs> well, the state knows they just aren't practical anymore. We're all trying to meet our global carbon deal. Electric bikes are so much better for getting around our neighbourhood. And why waste valuable space on car parks when you can use them to grow food? I don't care what you say, Alex. They don't deserve to live in that ghetto. They are completely disconnected. No high-speed transport system, no new internet. They miss out on jobs and many essential services too. Oh, <laughs> hi again. <laughs> what a day. I had to make a, an emergency visit to the Cry Freedom ghettos. I mean, I miss my sister like mad, but I'm glad they went when they moved to New Amsterdam. They're safe from climate change on the floating city. <laughs> that must be her now. It's much easier to meet up with friends virtually now. Well, so many cities have banned cars in central areas. Ooh, looks like she's got some juicy gossip. Plandopolis, everyone, are you ready to be assigned your work environment and your living quarters and your meat rations and all the rest? Yes, it's coming. Um, again, no editorializing, because now we have arrived at the far off year of 2045, which promises to be a new era for humanity. Our forecast for the next 40 years, February 2012. Global Future 2045 Congress is held in Moscow. It is a debate platform for discussion of our civilization's prospects for development. 2012 to 2013, the global economic and social crises are exacerbated. The debates on the global paradigm of future development intensifies. New transhumanist movements and parties emerge. Russia 2045 transforms into World 2045. Simultaneously, the 2045.com International Social Network for Open Innovation is expanding. Here, anyone interested may propose a project, take part in working on it, or fund it, or both. In the network, there are scientists, scholars, researchers, financiers, and managers. 2013 to 2014, new centers working on cybernetic technologies for the development of radical life extension rise. The race for immortality starts 2015 to 2020. The avatar is created, a robotic human copy controlled by thought via brain-computer interface. It becomes as popular as a car. In Russia and in the world appear, in testing mode, several breakthrough projects. Android robots to replace people in manufacturing tasks. Android robot servants for every home. Thought-controlled avatars to provide telepresence in any place of the world and abolish the need for business trips. Flying cars. Thought-driven mobile communications built into the body or sprayed onto the skin. 2020 to 2025. An autonomous system providing life support for the brain and allowing it interaction with the environment is created. The brain is transplanted into an avatar B. 
With Avatar B, man receives new, expanded life. 2025, the new generation of avatars provides complete transmission of sensations from all five sensory robot organs to the operator. 2030 to 2035, ReBrain. The colossal project of brain reverse engineering is implemented. World science comes very close to understanding the principles of consciousness. 2035, the first successful attempt to transfer one's personality to an alternative carrier. The epoch of cybernetic immortality begins. 2040 to 2050, bodies made of nanorobots that can take any shape arise alongside hologram bodies. 2045 to 2050, drastic changes in social structure and in scientific and technological development. All the prerequisites for space expansion are established. For the man of the future, war and violence are unacceptable. The main priority of his development is spiritual self-improvement. A new era dawns. The era of neo-humanity. Once again, I'm going to leave that vision of the future uh, it, to, to, for your own exploration. I will put the link in, obviously, so you can go and watch that in its full context and find out more about how and where and when that video was produced. But let me just say, once again, these are visions of the future that have been put on the table. And I think not only as a way of imagining what could be, but also to predictively program the population to accept certain future possibilities or even to move towards certain future possibilities and at any rate to shape the infrastructure of governments and militaries and other types of long-term strategic planners to actually creating the infrastructure that will be needed to bring about these realities, even some of the dire ones that they are warning about. Um, it's an interesting process. What we are thinking about, what we are looking at, the way that we are being asked to envision the future helps to actually bring that future about, not in some mystical cosmic way, but in that in the exact same way that when steering the car and looking at a pothole in the road, you don't look at the pothole if you're trying to avoid it because you're going to steer right into it. If you're thinking about this or that potential reality for the future, you're going to start structuring your life and structuring the resources that you have at your proposal to deal with that envisioned future and in a sense helping to bring that future about. And that is an important aspect of all of this. I don't think that the would-be elitists, the superclass, so-called, genuinely can control everything and control the future and control the world in a simplistic cartoon supervillain sense. Obviously, these are the types of people who have enormous resources at their disposal to bring about certain developments and to steer them in one direction or another, and also to shape, perhaps most importantly, the public's perception of those events as they happen through their control of m mainstream media. And that's why the internet flowering of independent media on the internet over the past couple of decades has been such a thorn in the side, um, necessitating the, the, the delaying of the Agenda 21 vision to Agenda 2030. And now 2030 is the new deadline. And as we approach that deadline, we start to see the ban hammer coming down to make sure that we get these voices off the internet. Repeal 230, guys. So we know where this is going, or at least where they are trying to take it. And it is towards, as I've said before, not a trans-human future, but a post-human future. What they are looking for, essentially, is to engineer at the genetic level, eventually, engineer the human species into a compliant cattle species to be used to propagate the, uh, the, the world for the elitists, who will literally be a technologically upgraded superclass that will be essentially a different species. And again, that sounds outlandish. It sounds ridiculous. But I will send you back once again to a, I believe it was a 2006 BBC article. I will give you the link where you can see scientists are saying that eventually with uh, the gen rich and gen poor and the division between people who take the genetic upgrades and not, we're going to have a, a, basically this giant warrior species, the uh, almost godlike creatures, and then there will be these these other creatures that'll be these squat goblin-like creatures, and they have the illustration there on the article. It's just, it's ridiculous, but <laughs> they've been talking about this for a long time. Eloy and Morlocks is not just a science fiction concept from the head of H.G. Wells. He wrote a lot of nonfiction too, and I think 
that is a vision of the future. Are you ready to get off this particular ride? Do you not want these visions to come true? Hey, yeah, me neither. So really, the, I think the point of all of this is to say, okay, here it is. Here's the future that they are actively talking about and bringing about with their actions and their resources. What do we do about that? How do we construct our own vision of the future to put against that vision of the future? And that is something that I think is absolutely worth our time and attention and efforts. In the spirit of Solutions Watch and the solution-oriented 2021, I think we need to be putting our time, attention, energy, and resources into what should the future look like? Not not what what are they telling us? Are we are, what kind of existence we're going to be allowed to live out in our planned opolis 20, 20 years from now. No, no, no. What can we do to create a vision of the future that we want to bring into existence? What is that vision? Now, obviously, I'm not conceited enough to think that I know exactly how the world should be and what it should look like and how it should be run and blah, blah, blah. Of course not. But I think it is something that we all need to start thinking about and seeing how we can start shaping our lives around that. That's why I'm going to leave that as a bit of a homework assignment for the, the listeners of this podcast. If you have made it through this tour of the future and are now thinking for yourself, well, what do I want the world to look like and how, what kind of steps would it take to get there? I would like you to articulate that vision. Start to plan it out. Think about it. Leave it in the comments if you want or not. Make a journal or whatever it is that you do, but start actually putting your mind to it. I am going to do the same and I'm going to follow up on this episode of Visions for the Future with an episode that speaks to the possibilities for the future that we could be constructing and what we can do to start bringing that about. And I haven't quite determine the final form of such a exploration or even what that vision is in all its entirety, that will be informed by the feedback that I get from you guys out there. So please do let me know some of your thoughts about the vision of the future that we want, because we know the vision of the future that they are talking about. And I don't know about you, but I don't want that vision. I don't want that vision to become reality. So we better start, we better stop looking at that pothole in the road and start looking out in the distance where we actually want to travel to and seeing how we can get there. All right, there's a lot of information here to digest as always. And as always, I will exhort you to go to the show notes so that you can get all of the documents and videos and other things that have been cited today and see them and read them and digest them in your own uh, way than seeing them in their full context and then thinking about the future that you want to bring about. And I'm looking forward to continuing that that process of envisioning a future that we can actually positively enact in the future here at The Corbett Report. But that's going to do it for today. I am your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Looking forward to talking to you again in the near future.